We are at the New England Carousel Museum in Bristol, Connecticut. At my show of carousel works that I have done over the last 45 and 50 years, sort of the apex of my career. We named the show Carousels of this Century mostly because carousels are known for the most part at the turn of the century. Most of the museum pieces here are constructed out of wood and they are of that era, the 1890s or turn of the century. This show is of work that's been done in the last 40 years and the concentration is on casting in fiberglass resin. These are all cast fiberglass pieces and those of us who work in fiberglass have always said that carousel makers of the turn of the century had, had the technology of making fiberglass pieces, they would have because carousels for the most part are dependent on how much weight they're carrying. So fiberglass is so much lighter than wood pieces. Most of the pieces here are from my collection, which was made from casts of pieces that were done for carousels that we manufactured from all over the world. We will go through the show and we'll show you individual pieces and, and backstories of each one as we go along. Nineteen sixty nine, my wife and I met and we were married in about to celebrate our fiftieth anniversary here in a few weeks. And we both graduated from the museum school in Boston and I was a painter and she was a sculptor and we were faced with the problem of how you make a living as two artists living together. And we started a company called Briggs, Bugs and Butterflies. We made large wooden butterflies that were hung on the wall as decorative items and bugs of similar size that went with them. And we started showing at national shows around the country and set up a wholesale business. By 1972, we were fully employed with our own company. And in 1977, we met Marvin Silver, who was a manufacturer of fiberglass castings in Queens, New York. And he was running a company doing visual merchandising items for major stores around the country. We started working and doing work for FAO Swartz, Neiman Marcus, all the major stores we did projects for through him. And I would do all of the designing and original pieces and then they would be cast and painted in his facility. He decided to transfer his company into a carousel manufacturing company. And the first project he did was in Herald Center in the middle of Manhattan. And the second project he did was in Woodbridge, New Jersey. He hired me as the designer of that carousel and sculptor and hired my wife as a principal painter for the carousel. And then shortly thereafter, the next year, Marvin Silver took on the restoration of the Forest Park Carousel in Queens, New York. Now this carousel is over 60 feet in diameter. It has four rows. It's a huge carousel and it had been setting empty for some 20 years and we were the first crew to go in and open up the building and start to work on it. This carousel had no decoration whatsoever, it just had its animals on the carousel which were beautifully done. It's a mellow carousel, one of the finest that he had ever done. And so I was given the task of designing decorative pieces for the carousel itself and one of the first pieces we did was uh, called an inside drowning board. This is this piece here, which I used as a huge face. And we did 
the full enclosure of the inside of the carousel around the original band organ, designed all the pieces for that and manufactured all of the decorative pieces for the carousel itself and restored the carousel to its, uh, what we investigated as being its original painted look. From there on, we were working with Fabricon and they would make at least one or two carousels a year. Now some of the carousels were international. We had ones that we made for Finland, some that went to uh, Brazil, some that went to uh, other parts of the world. We'll show you a few of those as we go along. This particular one was done as a Western carousel design. A client would come with a theme for a carousel and I would be given the task of taking that theme and applying it to the machine itself, its size and in the style. And principally I was doing, for the most part, doing decorative parts of the carousel, not the entire carousel. So when I was given the task of designing a carousel, I would do a theme drawing of what the carousel might look like. And then other decorative panels that would go with the carousel. This is an inside decorative panel that would go inside the carousel itself. The show has several what are called rounding boards, so the, the outside part of the carousel, the decorative panel that goes on the outside of the carousel. And the one you see here is for a carousel that went to Sao Paulo, Brazil. It was used several times for other carousels, but the first time it was, it was manufactured was for that particular carousel. And what I did here is uh, I tried something that I've never tried before, and that's putting glass pieces along the bottom of the carousel so when the light hits it, it refracts. The piece behind me is uh, another rounding board from the Macau carousel done in 1992. The casts that I have here are, are not painted as they, as they would have been in the carousel itself. There's two sides to that. As a sculptor, it's nice to see the shapes as a, as a one color. The color itself tends to confuse the, the shape itself. This is a rounding board from the Bryan Park carousel. Uh, it's actually not a rounding board. It was made for D Disneyland in uh, a couple of years earlier than the, when it was used for a rounding board. Uh, the original use for it was behind the counter of the Boardwalk Hotel in, in uh, Disney World, Florida. Originally it had a mirror in this part of it. A group of people who were in charge of the uh, Manhattan Library. And there's a small park behind the library called Bryan Park. It's very small. There's not much to it. And they wanted a little carousel that they could fit between the trees. They didn't want to cut any trees down. So this carousel had to fit between the trees. It was about 18 feet in diameter. It's got five sections to it. And on that carousel, they used this as a rounding board. And also on the carousel, there's numerous other pieces that I produced over the years, including some of the butterflies that we originally did in the 70s that we had cast some of the butterflies and they used them as decorative items on the outside of the carousel. Oddly enough, this little carousel is probably the most beloved carousel of any of the ones that Fabricon produced, treasured by Manhattanites. Each carousel we would take uh, pieces that were Americanized uh, original pieces and combine them with new pieces. So each time we would make a new carousel we'd make new decorative panels and uh, usually an accent piece or two went on the carousel. 
In the Macau carousel, this is one of the pieces that was made for the carousel and then later used for other carousels. This piece was created for the Saudi carousel. As I remember, the Saudis were particularly interested in Americanized horses and uh, they only requested this zebra to go on it as, a, as an accent piece. And then it was used uh, several times afterwards, California and Arizona. This is a major piece from the Navy Pier carousel in Chicago, done in 1995. It's a freestanding stationary piece. It was the showpiece for the carousel itself. This carousel was quite large, about 60 feet in diameter, had uh, three rows. Later on, this was used several places in Saudi Arabia and in Hong Kong and also Phoenix, Arizona, for just to name a few of them. Between the 80s and the 90s were the high points of the carousel manufacturing for, uh, for Fabricon. When we decided to do this show, uh, the emphasis was to show the processes of doing a modern carousel pieces. And unlike in the past where the animals would have been made out of wood and they would have been one off at a time, this process is doing the original out of plaster medium and then making a mold of them and then casting. This is the original, what's called the original plaster. Well, there are three original plasters in the show. When making a plaster piece for this carousel, what would happen is I would make a scale drawing of what I wanted the piece to look like. It would be on an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. And then I would blow it up 400% to its full size, which is 4.5 feet. And then I would be able to take scale uh, drawings and, and dimensions off from that to produce the actual piece. So in this case, I would start, I would make a cut out of the fish itself in its dimensions slightly smaller than what this is, and that would be the base piece for making the plaster. So this piece of wood that you see behind here in the center of the, of the uh, fish itself would be the piece that I would start from. Then I would use that as a reference for the jumper pole. This is a jumper pole running up and down it. Well, keeping in mind uh, other parts of the uh, limitations of creating a carousel animal, it's, it's width and other factions that, that are required for safety reasons. So these pieces would be put in, in three-dimensionally. Then I would uh, fasten chicken wire over it. That's what this is here, is chicken wire. And then once that's on there, then I would put a layer of plaster impregnated cloth, which is this part right here. Put direct plaster on, and while it's still green and somewhat pliable, then you can rasp it and clean it. And then you put another layer on, and when you let that dry, sand it to the surface that you're looking for, then clean it and sand it some more. That's the process of producing what's called an original plaster. That's what this is. And this would be a mold. The mold is made out of two, two parts. One part is rubber, and the other part is a, what's called a mother mold, which in this case is resin. The rubber holds the, the detail while the mother mold holds the rubber in place while it's being cast. So this would be the negative space created by the, by the mold. This is the cast from this mold of, that I made of just the front of the, of the fish. This shows the cast is what it looks like when it comes out of the mold with a flashing around the seam. So this gets ground off to the surface and then sanded, hand sanded so that you get prepared for the, for the painted surface. In fact, the entire surface 
that before it's painted it gets uh, partially sanded so the paint will take to it easily. In this case I cast the eye in the piece itself so I know exactly where the eye is going to go. When the final piece is ready, the cast is done and we're ready to put the eye in, I grind this section out where the eye is going to go. I make a panel someplace that's where you can't see it that I can get my hand in and then put the eye in from the inside and put uh, epoxy clay against the, the back of the eye to hold it in place. That's how the eye gets put into the final casting. A lot of work between the final plaster piece, the mold, and the final cast. In 2005, Fabricon was commissioned to do the Detroit Carousel. This is the last carousel that Marvin Silver was involved in. He uh, passed away in 2007. This carousel was one of two that was a major full design carousel from top to bottom. The entire carousel was designed and uh, designed around what the client was looking for. The carousel is mounted on the Detroit River. It has no building around it. It is fully standing out in, in the weather. And we designed it so that the roof of the carousel would shed snow and ice and water. Uh, the carousel was 22 feet in diameter, it's, uh, 10 sections. A small carousel, two row. And the theme of the carousel was the flora and fauna of the Detroit River. And what I used on the inside rounding board was clouds and butterflies. The sub-design quality of it is uh, scrolls and Victorian looking stuff. I worked with a master painter named Bill Rogers and we would work on designs. This is the egret. It's one of the animals from the Detroit River theme. This is the heron, the freestanding piece that stood behind the chariot, which was Swan Chariot. This is one of the animals from the Detroit River that uh, was celebrated on the carousel. This is the spacer panel from the Detroit Carousel. A spacer panel is a smaller panel that connects uh, the rounding boards on the outside of the carousel. It's a decorative panel that covers the seam between the the larger panels. In this case I used uh, a dragonfly and a sunflower design in some Victorian type style at the bottom of it. Billy Rogers also the master painter used iridescent paint on the wings and other parts to give it this iridescent kind of flavor. This is a decorative panel. It went on the bottom section of the motor surround. The top part of the motor surround was a continuous scene of the Detroit River. It's of the walleye fish, which is a, a native fish of the Detroit River. And then I mixed with that the Victorian style with it. and. Billy Rogers used the uh, iridescent paint you can find in uh, each paint is a uh, uh, additive which makes it iridescent. Also on this panel you will see uh, some of the mechanical drawings that go with producing the carousel. We're working with the manufacturers making the mechanical part of the carousel and I have to design around his mechanics to make sure that the decorative panels fit on the mechanics of the carousel. In 2007, uh, the Fabricon Carousel Company ceased to exist. In 2010, I was contacted by the Greenway Conservancy in Boston. The Greenway Conservancy is in charge of the park system, which is built over what's called the Big Dig in Boston, which is the tunnel that runs north and south underneath the, the city. And they were in charge of making parks on the top of what was then the tunnel underneath. 
Sometime in the 70s, we had seen rendered drawings of what the POC system might look like. And one of the rendered drawings had a carousel proposed to be on the park. And at the time, we said to ourselves, well, that would be fabulous to have a carousel in, in Boston and be able to work on it. In the late 90s, uh, we were approached by uh, the uh, uh, Battery Park pe people in Lower Manhattan to design a carousel for the Battery Park. And we did a set of drawings and concept drawings for them and they didn't, eventually didn't go with us to make a carousel. But they had uh, loved the drawings and the person who was in charge of the park, when they were contacted by the Conservancy in Boston in 2010 and asked who would, they should contact to make a, a custom carousel for their Greenway carousel, the lady said, yes, go talk to Jeff, he's just up the road from you. So that's how that project started in 2010. The whole idea behind the carousel in Boston was that uh, the Greenway had considered itself as a respite between the urban center and the ocean bay part of Boston. They were designing their parks with the idea of celebrating the flora and fauna of Boston environment. And that became the theme of the carousel itself. The carousel uh, basically was earth, sky, and air. We designed around that in celebrating the animals that were on the carousel. At one point the list was 40 different animals. We had to get it down to 11. One of the ones that was always prominent on the list was the peregrine falcon. When I started designing the falcon, the animal itself is known for its ability to dive at great speeds. And when it does dive, it tucks its wings under its body, sort of like a jet plane. And the first designs that I did was of that, uh, showing this famous diving look. But the problem with the design was that the falcon, for the most part, is not very interesting color-wise on the outside of the bird. It's very gray and muted colors. And I kept thinking about it and seeing pictures of how beautiful the bottom part of the bird, the breast of the bird, bottom part of the wings. And it reminded me of some sculptures that my mother used to have that hung on the, her kitchen wall of a series of birds flying with their wing up and their wing down with the, with the belly showing out. So I grabbed up on that design and came up with this. Fortunately for this particular carousel, the, the mechanical part of the carousel is done by carousels and carvings out of Marion, Ohio. And his philosophy is that he goes back to the original designs of carousels and goes to a larger, much more formatted carousel. The advantage being that the floor distance between the floor of the carousel and the sweeps is 9 feet 6 inches whereas normal carousels that are produced most of these days are around seven, six. So that gives you this enormous space between the floor and the ceiling of the carousel. In this particular design, I push that aspect right to its nth degree so that we use that entire space between the top and the bottom of the bird The only thing that makes it able to do is the fact that the carousel was, had such a huge space. Behind it you see what's referred to as the shop drawing. So what I would do is make mechanical drawings in scale of what I thought the bird should look and then scale it up full size so that I have dimensions of what size I would make each part of this, this uh, structure as I built it. The other thing we did with this is we 
actually built a cage which represented the space between the floor and the sweeps so that when we assembled it, we made sure that all the dimensions were correct and it would work within the space. The Greenway carousel is a three row carousel. In most cases with a third row of, of animals on a carousel, you hardly ever see them because the first two rows pretty much block whatever is going on in the back. So I decided that I should create something which could fill the space above the two animals in the front. And so I selected butterflies as being something we could put above the other animals on a three row carousel so the third row could only be 44 inches long. In most cases a 44 inch uh, carousel animal is considered a children's carousel animal, not an adult because you can't make the seat large enough for an adult. So I struggled with the dimensions of trying to create an animal which could be an adult assisted seat. An adult assisted seat has to be about 15 inches long. So I designed this as being, um, it's 15 inches from the front to the back. And so it's large enough for an adult to ride, but small enough so it could fit within the dimensions of the, of the uh, carousel itself. On a carousel, you never know if the inspector of the carousel, who's also a local inspector, will inspect something and approve it or not. This particular animal is creating a visual blind for the rider. In other words, when somebody's sitting on the saddle, they can't see by these wings necessarily, and I was concerned that it, the inspector would not okay this particular animal, but we got that to happen. There are three types of butterflies on the Greenway Carousel. This is the Eastern Swallowtail, and then we did the Buckeye and the Monarch Butterfly. Carousel animals, for the most part, you can get eyes for them through taxidermy manufacturers. You can order eyes which are slightly sm larger than what a normal eye would be. In other words, if, uh, you buy an eye for a bird that's, uh, uh, I don't know, 10 centimeters and you can get them to make it 40 centimeters. But unfortunately for uh, bugs, the eye shape is not round, it's an oval. So what we actually did was we created, I created original eyes in this shape, polished them to the nth degree, and then had uh, technicians make a mold, and we cast these, vacuum cast these as, uh, as uh, castings with the color inside of them. That's how the eye is manufactured. Grasshopper was particularly challenging to create as a carousel animal because it has six legs, two antennae, and two delicate wings. <laughs> so you can't make things that stick out from a carousel animal because it'll get destroyed in no time. The Boston Carousel has 100,000 riders per year, and we go in twice a year and do repairs on it. So what I did basically is I attached all of the six legs against the body, and the antenna is also attached against the body. And the wings are tucked underneath and making it the saddle of the actual piece. This is the squirrel from the Greenway Carousel. Unlike the other two animals that have long tails, I decided to wrap the, the tail up over its back to make the saddle of the actual piece. In the Greenway Carousel, because we were trying to get everything as natural as possible, there aren't really any saddles. I actually took the animal itself to make the saddle. So in this case, I took the tail of the animal itself to make the saddle. When I was trying to uh, sculpt this piece, uh, my wife had just come back from a walk, and she said she had noticed a dead squirrel laying in the pathway. I said, well, God, that's what I need immediately. So I went, ran out and found it, 
And so I had a real squirrel to follow. And he, he helped me a lot when he came to the face of the squirrel because the squirrel has two sets of uh, incisor teeth in the front, grinding teeth in the back. And I was not interpreting that way when I was making him originally. So as soon as I saw that, I changed it immediately. Whenever I'm designing a carousel animal, I spend usually many hours doing research on each animal, collecting photographs, getting vital information about uh, their lifestyle and what they look like. And with that, I collect up what's called, I call it a show panel. I basically take and take all of these photographs and other information and paste them up on a panel and sort of stick it around my studio and that gives me inspiration and uh, helps me with the design. And then later on, when we considering the color of the animal, when we finally get around to it, I take some of those photographs that are the better color themes and put them together for the painter itself. And this is a, what's the painter panel. It shows different color combinations of the eastern swallowtail and then my adaptation of those color themes into the des final design of the piece itself. And then after that I take and uh, take color swatches and pick out color swatches that I like of each color that I would like to see on, on the animal. And then put the color swatch beside each one so that he has a reference of what the materials should look like. For instance, here it says forward wing and it has the colors for the forward wing, the backward wing, the colors for that, and then other spot eye stuff that goes on and then the actual body itself. What you see here is my color swatch and then him putting color swatches beside it with his airbrush to pick out what matches the color. In other words, he takes and squirts a little color beside it to match it up. So this is the color panel that goes to the painter. This is one panel from the motor housing decorative panels from the Greenway Carousel. The Greenway Carousel theme was land, sea, and air. And uh, what we used for the inside of the carousel was land. So these are flowers and some land animals and the monarch butterfly. This piece would have been done in hard clay with the understanding that it would be hard to paint. So uh, what we decided to do was spray the background a neutral green color and then just brush, airbrush the colors into the top of it rather than try to hand paint each section of it. This is a picture of Emily Cass, who's the benefactor of the carousel, Greenway Carousel. 19, uh, 2010, she was considering giving a sum of money to the Greenway to do a project. And so she was walking with the director of the Greenway on the park system. And they had temporarily set up a carousel to see if it would be feasible in the park system and she immediately attached to that and wanted to give some money to have the carousel built on the greenway with two stipulations one that it would be funded by trees and it would be partly designed by children so we actually took and consulted children asking what animals they would like to see on the carousel and so they were part of the selection process of creating animals for the carousel. This photograph here was taken of her at my studio. We finished a number of uh, pieces and set them up so people could take pictures of them and of the photographs of them. She at the time was in her late 80s and so we're all standing around talking and uh, one of the uh, attendees from the conservancy asked if she would like to sit on one of the animals and which one would she like to sit on 
And to our surprise, she said yes. And then I went into a panic trying to figure out how the heck I was going to get her on it. But she, she did pretty good. I put a little box down. She stepped up on it. And there she is. That's the photograph of Emily Cass. This is the lobster from the Greenway Carousel. It's one of two pieces that were uh, produced as secondary pieces from the carousel as intended gifts to the New England Carousel Museum in the name of Emily Cass. When she donated the money for the Greenway Carousel, she had requests. One was that any of the animals that were produced for the Greenway Carousel should never appear in any other carousels in the future. So we made an agreement that we would produce two pieces, the falcon and the lobster, so that uh, I could use them for the following years as demonstration pieces in, in my own private collection as long as they went to the museum when they finally uh, decided to dispense with them. And that's what's happened in conjunction with this show. The lobster is an interesting character for a carousel animal because in reality, the lobster is covered with little burrs all over itself to protect itself from predators. So you kind of have to calm it all down <laughs> and show enough stuff that it has to protect itself, but at the same time not make it so that it can't be ridden. One of the things we did do is when we first started to investigate lobsters, I bought a real lobster so I could see what it looked like. And when you see a real live lobster, its eyes are sticking out in this big round shape, sticking out in the air like that. And when the lobster passes, which was most cases, that's when people see it, the eye retracts into the body and you don't see it that way. When I first saw it, I said, how am I going to produce an eye that looks like that? And I kept thinking and thinking, and I says, I remember when I was a kid, you could get these great big marbles, these playing marbles. I said, I bet if I went to a, to a toy store, I could find something that looked like that. Sure enough, went to the local toy store, and there they were. Also, with this particular animal, you had delicate things like antennae <laughs> that you have to do something with because you can't just stick it out in the air because it'll be broken almost immediately. So you try to attach things to each other, the two claws attaching to each other. I often get asked, well, why isn't it orange? And I said, well, an orange lobster is a dead lobster. Well, I just learned just last week, as a matter of fact, that they just discovered an orange lobster that they immediately brought to an aquarium. Apparently lobsters come in all kinds of different colors and I, I just assumed that uh, a lobster would be green and purple and a little bit of orange when it was alive. But that's not the case. They come in all kinds of different colors. Also, when I was developing the lobster, I was more intrigued by this claw as opposed to that claw. It's far more dramatic. But in reality, a lobster actually has that claw on the left-hand side and this claw on the right-hand side. So I swapped them over. And later on, I discovered, well, that's not necessarily true, that they not always have one claw on one side and one on the other all the time. Sometimes it's reversed. Anyway, <laughs> over time, we've learned all kinds of things.